Soyez bienvenue aux extrêmes de Satani à Paris. Je m'appelle Charmely. Il est David. So, hello everybody. So, for those of you who don't speak perfect French like my co-host, my name's David and this is Charmely. So, oh. hang on, we have a technical glitch which is <laughs> about to be sorted out. How's your week been? My week was great. Amazing. Mine too. We're in beautiful Paris and it's sunny shining. And we're in here. But hopefully within an hour we'll be all done and mm. out enjoying the sun. Enjoying the sun. Like the rest of Paris. Paris. So folks, we're starting again. So do we start from the beginning? We're not streaming anywhere, are we? Oh, well, we're streaming live at the moment, but uh, as is quite usual, we're having technical difficulties and um, we're trying to actually be seen in another room as well. So, you know, you can see us wherever you are, but people elsewhere in the building can't see us. So um, we're just trying to sort that out before we start. So we apologize for the little glitch and we'll uh, get rolling as soon as we can. So... For you out there, obviously we're in Paris um, and we'll give you a little welcome soon, but the sun is shining, it's beautiful and uh, it's quite unusual, so I'm, I'm boiling in here. Right. Um, I would suggest you take your jacket off, but uh, I think it's better leave it disrupt on. the <laughs> microphone feed. Yes, I know. Oh. oh. Anyway, there's lots to see in Paris. We went to the museum, so lots of fine art, and we also saw, um, we had lots of nice food, mm -hmm. um, which is amazing. We lot met a lot of our European colleagues, Yes. so it's good to be at Actrims. Yes, so I guess there's been lots to learn uh, today, and uh, for those of you who are watching us, and while they're sorting out the glitches, we, were, we don't want to talk about the meeting too much, but there's obviously been a, a, a sea of new drugs arriving, so that's on the way, and we're here. Right, so the outline of our discussion today is about... So, starting again... Um, soyez, uh, bienvenue aux extremes de cette année à Paris. Je m'appelle Chamley, il est David. So bonjour, uh, my name's David, for those who don't speak perfect French like my co-host, and this is Chamley. So uh, the outline of uh, our discussion today is to start with the plenary session and then move on to remyelination with the anti-lingual findings 
And then there's a lot of discussions about reclassifying MS, so I'll be looking at the clinical criteria, revisions for MS, particularly um, for the progressive MS. And then uh, David will talk about spinal lesions and their significance. And I'll end with um, what progressive MS drugs are currently available. Now, we'd also be looking at posters subsequently after this. And uh, of course, we're here for you. And so please tweet us your questions to uh, at Bart's MS blog. So obviously, ask us questions. There have been lots and lots of different sessions. And we can't be everywhere, at, but we'll try and answer what we can. And of course, we have had some of your questions. So along the way, we'll try and answer some of those. So without any ado, I'll uh, leave my co-hosts will start the proceedings. Um, so the plenary session was done by the god of um, pathology, Hans Lassmann. So he started off as we were in Paris with uh, the Charcot discussion, where in Charcot in 1880 described the presence of MS plaques associated with veins and venules. So the venular hypothesis is not a new thing and existed in the 1800s. So he then moved on to focus predominantly about cortical pathology and the different types of cortical lesions. So you have the type 1 lesions, which are cortical or subcortical, i.e. below the cortex of the brain, and then within the cortex of the brain called intracortical, and then the subpeal lesions, which are just below the meninges, which are the outer coating of the brain. Now, what he said was quite significant, which is that when you have high lesion load in the subpeal region, this is more prevalent in progressive cases than in acute or relapsing remitting cases. So this is quite significant. Now, where are these lesions actually found? Well, not surprisingly, they're predominantly found in the limbic um, system. What do you and mean by limbic? So limbic is the area of the brain very deep down, which deals with uh, memory and uh, cognitive function. And there's another region where these um, lesions are found, which is in the hippocampus, which is your main memory center in the brain, so in the temporal lobe of the brain. So it's not surprisingly, these subpeer lesions will affect cognition. Interestingly, um, part of the brain which has often been overlooked, which is the cerebellar cortex. That's it, like at the back of the brain, isn't yes. it? Yes. And um, in there, you also find a lot of these um, subpeer lesions. And this may be why we may find people who are quite ataxic or wobbly on their feet. But when we scan them, we may not find any actual white matter lesions, but they may actually have cortical lesions, which is leading to the disability. So interesting. Now, in in terms of the breakdown of the pathology, what are the, what's happening in these um, cortical lesions? Well, um, about 39% of these lesions have a, a massive reduction in uh, neuronal quantity, and there's a massive loss of dendritic spines, which are the spines coming off dendrites, which will affect connectivity, obviously. So there's a massive neuronal failure in these cortical lesions, which is significant. Then um, he finished by saying, well, how is the meningeal inflammation linked to what happens in cortical demyelination? And he hypothesized this possible soluble factor, which may be released by the infiltrating lymphocytes from the meninges, which then pass down deeper into the microglia, which are doing the active demyelination. Do you have any idea what the soluble factor was? Well, we know what it isn't. And What's that? Is that? Well, it's not antibody. Really? Yes. So we can hazard a guess at what else is there in MS outside of antibodies. But if you took away the antibodies from the MS um, CSF, you still got the lesions. So that's quite interesting. So um, he then uh, said that a lot of um, what you're finding in progressive MS is um, oxidative stress. And he introduced the most topical mitochondrial pathology. And um, the problem here is we don't have a good way of monitoring this as far as MRI is concerned. So um, he did say that um, he did some post-mortem specimens at seven Tesla um, recording and found that they had iron rims around these lesions. Now, obviously, to actually get those images, he did 16 hours worth of scanning at seven Tesla. 
So I don't think that's clinically mm -hmm. feasible. I'm not sure if even you can tolerate more than uh, an hour's worth in an MRI scanner, especially a high field. So that was the plenary session. Mm. So a very interesting um, discussion mm. points raised from that by mm. Professor Lastman. Mm. So we then uh, go on to remyelination, mm. which David will take over. But there were, before I do that, there were just a, just as a point that there is obviously some conflict. And uh, the question is, is what are these factors? So some people have this week have been suggesting it's to do with oxygen and whether you get enough oxygen into the areas because, you know, thinking requires a lot of energy and energy requires um, fuel and the fuel is made by oxygen. So mm -hmm. that was one suggestion of how things could uh, work and um, we'll see. Um, there's some suggestions, obviously, how we can move that forward. Now, I guess one uh, question that always uh, raises its head is, you know, b besides doing the anti-inflammatory yeah. stuff, can we actually do anything for repair? And I guess we're in infancy, um, but we have started to move. And um, I think many of you might have heard of uh, recent work with clomestine. And it's in the forerunner of this uh, other molecule called uh, opicinumab, which is anti-lingo. And... Um, I guess we've, we've seen the studies and they kind of weren't as great as what we wanted yeah, to so see. Yeah, what, so what's new? Well, what has, is new is, is, is they've actually reanalyzed the data oh, uh, and they've actually statistical gone... Statistical glitch. No, no, no. They've looked in and they've looked and they found that actually if you look at certain groups of patients that actually there's an effect. And so what they believe is... Um, that there's a subgroup of, p of people who are actually showing some response. And I suppose it doesn't surprise us if, if we look at what was said, it's, it's kind of the younger people and people with some active kind of lesions. So I guess the question is, is does that mean the easiest way to um, do treatment is actually to repair the recent lesions? And I think that's perhaps maybe what, what can be seen or can be taken from that. But the good news is actually there is a view, and I'm kind of hearing on the grapevine, that there's probably going to be some more studies on this. So they're obviously confident enough that there is something really worthwhile to move forward on um, this, this new therapy. Now, of course, one of the things we do at the meeting is we don't always uh, just sit and, and see uh, what other people are talking about, we, but we also meet people. And I tell you some top secret information that there is a suggestion that um, some guys have found something that will make the drugs that we've actually got work even better. So we heard about the clomestine story. I think there's a hope that actually can make things work much better. But I'm sworn to secrecy, but you know, I'm a blabber. So I think that shows us in the future. I think maybe when that news breaks, it'll see how we can actually improve these remyelination therapies. So I think we're in early days, um, but we've seen um, uh, some positivity. Now, obviously with the clomestine, uh, which um, it potentially is used at a higher dose than is normally used, and it's caused fatigue in some people. So again, if we can work out how to improve that, then maybe we can try and uh, reduce the, the side effect, because obviously if it makes you drowsy, then it's not going to be so good. But also, the question we need to know is how long you need these drugs. Do you need to take them forever, or will a short burst uh, be, be enough? And I, hopefully, it'll be a short burst, but we'll have to wait and see. So, so um, moving on. So there was a lot of discussions about the clinical criteria re revisions. So in particular, the McDonald 2010 criteria was revised tw in 2017. What's the McDonald criteria? Well, the McDonald is. Uh, predominantly, well, not MACD, but um, it's predominantly to do with MRI classification of dissemination of lesions in space as well as development of lesions over time. So depending on how many lesions pop up in the brain, you can confidently diagnose MS using the MRI criteria. But obviously, misdiagnosis is a problem and you may put patients um, on highly active treatments which may not be required. So it's important that um, criteria, when they are revised, they are done in a sensible fashion. 
Now, what I loved about this criteria is the reintroduction of CSF after CSF oligoclonal bands after almost a decade of it being moved further down on the criteria. Um, and this is a phenomenal accomplishment. So what they've suggested is that in a typical CIS patient or person who presents with their first event of MS, um, if they fulfill the clinical as well as the MRI criteria for dissemination of lesions in space, then you can actually add in the oligoclonal band positive test as an additional um, finding and give a diagnosis of MS. So you can effectively speed up the time to diagnosis. So the positive oligoclonal band replaces the requirement for dissemination in time as far as the MRI criteria is concerned. Now, why, how can you use that? Well, in fact, being bands positive at the first event makes you uh, doubles your risk of having future events independent of MRI. So that's why it has a temporal significance and therefore can be used for dissemination in space. So we've had a question. So is it just, um, is McDonald only used for diagnosis or can it tell us about what may happen in the future? Well, the, there was an interesting poster which I came across um, from the Queen Square group where they said that McDonald criteria became less sensitive the longer the disease duration. So I don't think we can use the McDonald criteria for prognosis, but definitely it's designed for diagnosis. So it looks, uh, it has very high specificity and sensitivity and that's why we use it in clinical practice. Mm. Um, now. The other two modifications which are also quite significant to the existing 2010 criteria is that you can now use symptomatic um, as well as asymptomatic lesions, i.e. non-enhancing lesions um, for meeting dissemination in space or dissemination in time as far as the MRI is concerned. And um, a new, another new for the criteria is that you can include cortical as well as subcortical lesions um, to fulfill the dissemination in space. So this is very important. Now, we've had a question from someone in the US about OCBs um, saying that they don't do frequent LPs or no LP. That's a lumbar uh, puncture. Yeah, and uh, that's obviously it would be interesting to see what the impact of this new criteria is going to be. I think um, definitely more people are having lumbar punctures done and we need to know, given that we are now introducing anti-B cell treatments, what the changes which are going to happen, the band status are. So it's important. There are other advantages for performing lumbar puncture rather than simply just for speeding up the diagnosis. Um, so that was the 2010 uh, criteria revision this year. There was also some discussion about the progressive MS criteria, so the old um, secondary progressive and um, primary progressive criteria have uh, the advice is to dump those and to think about actually just progressive disease per se. So you can be active without any progression or you can have activity with progression or you can be not active with progression or not active without progression. So to distill all of that, what that means is that um, you just have to know whether you're progressing or you're active as far as your disease is concerned. Now, um, that makes it very much easier to treat people with progressive disease who have disease activity. So it may, be, it may have a very good outcome in that we can now start treating people who've got evidence of MRI activity or re clinical relapses, yeah. which I think is a win situation. So we're definitely moving our diagnosis and um, management along. No. as far as MS is concerned. So, well, we could go on, but I'm going to interrupt you quickly. We've had a, a, another question from a, a viewer in London, <laughs> and they said, um, the burning debate sounded like it was not a debate. So for those of you who don't know what the burning debate was, it was about, is MS a T-cell disease or is it a B-cell disease? And you were quite right. There was uh, not really much of a debate in the sense they both agreed that it's a T and a B cell um, problem. So I'll more on that later. Mm. Um, okay. Yes, and I think um, it was a difficult debate. And um, uh, we had our um, 
Twitter feed and they said majority agreed that it was probably a both B cell and a T cell disease. Um, so just um, moving on, um, David's going to discuss about spinal lesions, which yeah, I think are I guess, important I guess it, because we don't normally image um, spinal cords as far as monitoring MS disease. So it speaks to you know, the question that you asked about prognosis and uh, whether the McDonald criteria, which involves uh, imaging. And this was a, a, a study where they've actually, what they've done is they've taken uh, spinal images and uh, looked to see what was the likelihood of, of, of you converting into secondary progressive uh, multiple sclerosis 15 years later. So uh, they looked over the first kind of three years and, and if you had lesions in your spinal cord, unfortunately, it meant you had an increased chance of uh, developing secondary progression down the line. And the more lesions you had over the first three years, the more risk you had. So, I mean, obviously that's not good, but it's, it's perhaps gives you an indication of, of maybe the importance of getting uh, an MRI to check what your spinal lesions are in the first three years, because it may give you an indication of the projection of where your disease may take you. Now, you've got to remember that this isn't hard and fast, so there's no yeah. proof that if you have lesions, you will be in this position, but it's all about increasing your risk. So if you'd had lots of lesions over the first three years, you were 36 times more likely to develop a secondary progression down the line, and so if that is the trajectory, then it, it may influence how you think about how you're going to approach your treatment. So mm -hmm. I think that was the, the really potentially interesting thing is that it's, it's giving you more clues about how you make choices because the one thing that is very clear, you're going to have more and more choices of different types of therapies. They come with different side effects. Some are more effective than others and it's a question of uh, what risks come with each of the treatments. So um, this type of information mm -hmm. will probably help you make some choice. And so it's probably what it says is that you need to get an MRI. Yeah, I can. think, you know, you can um, add at the initial scan a C-spine study as well. So that's where majority of MS lesions, if they're happening at the initiating stage, are going to be. In. Mm. So it would be well worthwhile on your baseline scan having the head study as well as the C-spine done. And for those who are predominantly spinal cord lesions, then it may be worthwhile uh, discussing uh, with, uh, with the person looking after your case whether you might want to monitor that more mm. frequently than you would. So a C-spine, for those of you not quite, it's not about the C, it's about cervical. So that's kind of around your, mm. and your neck area. So um, obviously that's much more easier to, to uh, image than kind of lower down where, where your movement makes it a lot more awkward but um, nevertheless it was quite an interesting uh, Yeah, talk. so someone's just asked about lots of DMDs, risk from one to the next and the next and the next on the same person so um, I mean I think this is a good comment so you do in accumulate risk and in fact uh, the European Charcoal Foundation um, in one of their um, symposium discussed about induction treatment and how to actually utilize induction treatment. I definitely see our practice moving more in that direction. So the concept of what I mean by induction therapy is that you go with a very highly active drug which may delay then disease activity further down the line or if it's given, uh, hits the immune system robustly enough, it may in fact generate a cure for the disease. So the idea is that you go in with a highly active drug at the outset. Now, mm -hmm. obviously, we've uh, had a couple of treatments now come in, in particular the anti-B cell treatments come in as induction treatments, and um, there are side effects to think about of all of these. Now, the side effects which we're talking about, the usual side effects of immunosuppression like upper respiratory tract infections or UTIs, but also more from opportunistic infections. And more recently, there was a VZV, herpes, listeria, in alamtuzumab, and then PML risk to contemplate. And the more heavily immunosuppressive the drug is, the more likely you're to see that. Um, and more recently, there's been a scare with malignancies. I know the 
cladribine study originally was uh, um, thought to have this risk, but now the oracle um, findings are that it actually doesn't pan out in terms of malignancy risk. Yeah. But then uh, if you look at oculizumab in the PPMS cohort, there is that um, increased um, risk of breast cancer. So that mm. can't be ignored. No, I think, that, I think obviously that's one, one problem of, of, of autoimmunity. As um, uh, Shamali said, that there is obviously uh, s been some papers looking at the cancer risk and saying, Probably at the short, in the short term, it's probably no different, but obviously you've got to be cautious about what happens in the long term. Now, mm. it's, it's really interesting, a term you may um, uh, get to hear soon is a, a cert or a, um, and it's, 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 it's to like speak. So, um, you know, we've heard induction therapy, which is that short yeah. um, uh, treatment for a long term uh, effect. And so people are talking about a non specific. Or specific, which is CERT, uh, is it uh, immune reconstitution therapy, CERT. Um, okay. So you might hear that, um, and that means kind of selectively taking out certain types of white blood cells uh, rather than uh, a blanket uh, inhibition like um, a hemopoietic stem cell treatment. So we've got some uh, interesting questions come through. So one is, um, how long can I be immunosuppressed for? Well, how long is a piece of string? I mean, I think this is going to be very individual based, based on your previous um, cancer risk and based on family history risks so or genetics of previous um, uh, known um, breast cancer, for example, uh, risk will affect how long you're immunosuppressed for, because that's what we're talking about, the long-term cancer mm -hmm. risk from immunosuppression. Yeah. I mean, immune surveillance, if it's compromised, this is a major risk for the future. Um, now, another interesting question is what cancers should I be tested for? Um, again, difficult to answer. Uh, I mean, would I, before I um, put someone on long-term immunosuppression, would I be doing a whole body, chest, CT, um, chest, abdomen, pelvis? Um, why that face, David? I mean, uh, I think it's I possible because um, for other rare inflammatory disorders, I do actually request a baseline uh, CT chest abdominal pelvis, and in some cases, I do a PET scan at baseline as well. Yeah. So if that applies to the, my orphan inflammatory disorders, why shouldn't it apply for yeah. MS? Yeah, and it's like everything. You should be vigilant. R remember that men, you know, I know you don't think about those things, yeah. but... Be, Prostate, yes. Yes, you know, keep an eye out. Mm -hmm. So now moving on and continuing the theme of progressive, we kind of briefly went into relapsing, remitting MS there. So um, progression happens in about 30 to 60 percent of relapsing, remitting cases. Now, why is this statistic so broad? It's because it's the data from the natural history studies. And uh, what's becoming apparent now is that. Um, there may be methodological issues with natural history studies in that there is a divergence from what we think is the rate of progression uh, previously. So more, much of the newer studies are now reporting lesser component of their patient cohort pro actually progressing. This is not to say that MS is becoming more benign, but in fact it may be an effect of the treatments which have been given. Um, so. The face of MS is changing, mm. but it may be a treatment effect. Now, the hot drugs which were rediscussed, really um, the best at the moment is um, MD1003 or high grade um, pharmaceutical grade biotin. Now, um, obviously, we all know the findings of the biotin study which were reported before, which actually met its primary outcome with um, improvement in 13% of their treated arm. But what they presented here in addition is the MRI and also their natural history findings. So um, not, not natural history, real life data. So as part of um, their um, study, they also had this um, uh, um, introduction of um, on a basis, on a trial basis since 2015, if I remember, um, for French patients to access um, high-dose biotin, and they found a similar improvement in disability as they found in the MSI-SPY um, study, which was a biotin study. Um, 
So that's very reassuring. Now, everyone wants to know about does biotin actually neuroprotect? And so there was the um, subgroup analysis where some of the patients, um, if I'm precise, it's 74 patients, which is about half of the full cohort, had um, MRI done, and they found no difference in the uh, lesion counts. So it's not an anti-inflammatory, but um, surprisingly, and probably uh, more a reflection about how to monitor this, is that they found in all counts of brain volume assessment, whether it be whole brain volume or gray matter or white matter, there was a reduction in brain volume on high dose biotin, which seemed to pan out when the placebo arm was also swapped on to the biotin group. So this is very significant, and um, the, uh, the um, biotin group explained this as possible pseudoatrophy. Now, I what mean, does that mean? So pseudoatrophy is, as, a, as it says, um, it's not real brain atrophy. So when you reduce the inflammation in the brain, or the um, cellular swelling, then you can get a false reduction in brain volume, which is not true. So I think this kind of um, highlights what outcome measure you should really be using okay. in terms of these studies. Um, they did, however, find some uh, benefits in the non-conventional MRI um, measures, such as DTI and also in MTR. Which What's that? So now, MTR is difficult to explain, and so is DTI. Oh, I'll be here all day explaining that. Away. They're like weird, wacky brain imaging <laughs> techniques that um, yeah. they, they, they pick some things up, but, we, but it would take too long to explain if we had to tell you all this imaging stuff. And, uh, but the bottom line is they're used as possible surrogate markers of remyelination, so they are making hints that possibly biotin might help in remyelination, mm -hmm. although, um, to be frank, we don't know how, what the mode of biotin is still, although they suggest that there may be an effect on mitochondria. So moving on from biotin... Oh, we've got a question. Uh, it said, can you buy biotin? Well, the answer is we uh, recommend you buy it from the company who is selling it rather than your uh, health food shop. Good, because it's 100... It's a very high dose. and yes, um, it's very high, and it's not worth trying to take that many tablets. And I think the other thing is, is, is when uh, a company makes a drug, they actually have an undertaking to actually make sure that people are followed and, that, and it's safe and that you report any adverse events. So if you uh, take these things and you're not actually adequately monitored... You know, we want to ensure everything's safe. So our recommendations is, mm. you know, use the appropriate yeah. um, routes. The other findings which were reported was the Siponimod study, the EXPAND study in secondary progressive MS. Um, so this time round, they reported mm -hmm. on the MRI activity, and they showed that there was a reduction in uh, lesion activity as well as brain volume loss as early as month 12 in Siponimod, which was then sustained up to month 24. So this is Quite very quick, good. It? Yeah, it's quick, and it's a very good uh, outcome. Now, the one of the questions in the meeting was, well, how do we know by doing atrophy whether the benefits are not from just preventing new lesion formation from an anti-inflammatory or by actually presenting a, a true neuroprotective effect of the drug. So I don't think the outcome measure sufficiently answers that question, mm -hmm. which is very important. Um, then also from our Professor Gibanoni, he presented the post hoc analysis of natalizumab, the ASCEND study in secondary progressive MS, where he found um, that, like before, in disability outcomes such as the time 25-foot walk, as well as the um, nine-hole peg test, where you look at how quickly you can put the pegs in and take them out, that there is some improvement. Yes, ah. and you can get one of these from us. <laughs> if you want to do the 25-foot tw walk. We do also have a cardboard peg test, peg test. as well, but uh, I don't think we will do, mm -hmm. we'll show you that. I mean, Come um, to us on Bart's MS blog and we'll, we'll, we'll show you how. So uh, what he added was this new statistical methodology. So he looked at, if you look at overall disability, whether it improved or um, whether it got worse, you can see, you can plot that pictographically and look at the area volume underneath that. And what he found is that um, the 
um, chances of reaching these thresholds of disability under area under the curve analysis was less likely in the natalizumab group versus placebo. Um, he also found that the component which showed the greatest change was the nine-hole peg test. Now, why is that? Well, it's hand function, yes. So there's a lot of functional reserve in hand function. And if you're going to look for improvement in, a, in an outcome measure, then nine-hole peg test is the way to go. Yeah, so, so that's good. I mean, and I think the, the positive thing is it, it tells us actually that these drugs do do things in progressive MS. We just mm -hmm. have to yeah. look at them in a different way. It's not about always looking at uh, lower leg function. If we look at other, other things like the hands, we can actually show that these drugs really work. So can we treat progressive MS, David? Well, I mean, obviously there's been a few different things um, on, the, on the boil. Um, and I think the other things we should say is there's also a lot more uh, other uh, like mm -hmm. drugs like Siponimod. So there's the uh, Ozanimod, which is a, a, a new uh, mm -hmm. similar type of drug that um, has just been shown to be positive. So um, that's another alternative choice uh, on the way. Um, it may have slightly different side effects um, from the Fingolimod, so that's uh, interesting. And there's uh, other ones called Ponisimod. Um, so, you know, <laughs> there's we're, someone we're, asking in the audience, how do you say the new drug names? <laughs> I don't. I'm, I'm dyslexic. I can't really say these things. Um, yeah. yeah they're, 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 they're tongue twisters, but they'll have a, a nice new brand name when they get launched. It's um, easier to say. Easier, yeah. Um, so let's move on to the poster sections. Um, so if we look at the um, things which were posted on our BART's MS blog as far as the posters are concerned, I remember seeing something about cognition, really. Um, so there were some interesting, uh, lots of interesting stuff on cognition, and, but mainly in the poster sections. One was from the University of Forensic group who wanted to predict the long-term disease um, conversion in benign MS using cognition as an outcome. They had a 12-year follow-up where they showed that cognitive impairment was detected in 31.8% of benign MS cases. By the end of the follow-up, 32% were actually classified as no longer being benign MS. Now, what we mean by benign MS is a person who's still ambulatory with an EDSS score of less than, say, three. Um, which is um, a way of how we classify it. So uh, definitively, I think we're having to rethink what we understand as benign MS if there's cognitive impairment. Now, there was also another interesting poster which showed that cognitive impairment predicts work disability in terms of sickness, absence, and uh, disability pension um, utilization. So um, if you do the single-digit modalities test, which is a very, it's um, how you have to quickly, for each number, um, put in uh, what shapes they are. And so how quickly you can get to the bottom of the test. And they showed that those who performed really badly in the lowest quartile were twice as much more, twice as much to obtain work disability as those in the highest quartile. So um, that's quite interesting. Um, there was a systematic review from the New York group, which was uh, put as a poster where they looked at rehab potentials for cognition. And um, uh, the studies were felt not to be of high caliber in that they lacked active control groups or they were of any sufficient size. Mm. So I think definitely as far as cognition is yeah. concerned, more work needs to be done. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's again some of the things that you've been asking is like, I think there was a, a question about diet, wasn't there? And there was one study uh, on diet and uh, what is the influence on diet and, and MS? And, you know, it was done in a... There was one study done in a, a small group of patients, and essentially it says if you have low calories, you lose weight. So, uh, not <laughs> probably what you want to know. Um, and so, you know, we need to know more about how diet mm. affects, um, you know, MS and, and, and how things should go. There was a, there's a question about do the uh, um, metabolomics um, have any changes well they do they tend to be affecting mostly the lipid fractions 
mm -hmm. um, uh, when uh, diet was analyzed, which is not surprising. It, it may affect myelination in that way, so we don't know what these uh, metabolomic readouts actually mean, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so the other thing which was raised in the Bart's MS blog feed was about an update on pediatric MS, um, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. So again, a lot of the information for this comes from our posters, really. Um, there was some interesting work um, stating that uh, the McDonald 2010 criteria would, might not be sensitive in pediatric in MS. Mm -hmm. um, this was the Spanish group. Um, there was also another interesting piece of work saying that JCV antibodies um, occurred at the same frequency in pediatric group as in yeah. the adult group. Right. And um, which is also interesting as far as management, mm. which then uh, allows me to step on to what is available in pediatric MS as treatments. Well, there's Fingolimod. Yeah, so that's, I guess, one of the, the new bits of uh, hot news. So um, it, studies have uh, been shown that Fingolimod um, is active in, in children, just like it's active in human, um, humans. Adults, sorry, what am I? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so so that's quite good. Obviously, so it increases the armory of of of, of what happens to um, treat your children. So I think that's that's good news. Um, there was also a small poster talking about um, using natalizumab. So both fingolimod and natalizumab in this poster didn't show any difference between activity in the pediatric group. So they were both highly efficacious. So I think there is, go there is a pipeline definitely yeah. coming into yeah. pediatric group. I think, I think, you know, that makes sense because it's, it's biology at the end of the day. What's causing the disease in the children yeah. is the same as what's causing the disease in the animals. So. We did have a question about um, um, pregnancy and um, breastfeeding. Mm. And um, so what we did find, there was some studies to say uh, that some of the drugs and natalizumab actually goes into breast milk. So uh, obviously, think about that. Um, you know, obviously you don't want to be giving yeah. your uh, newborn um, uh, an immunomodulatory drug. So I mean, the, the thing here is the added, um, uh, the caveat to this is that actually more women who have MS are becoming pregnant and they're more likely to be now remaining on these drugs rather than coming off mm. them because by the time uh, we realize that they're pregnant, they've already spent about 16 weeks mm -hmm. um, where they've been on the drug. So that's important. So. Um, so as you said, the antibodies and the small molecules do get into breast milk. So uh, what is the trade-off between the two? Now, um, there was also an interesting uh, poster on uh, methylprednisolone treatment during um, breastfeeding. Yes. Um, so say you have a relapse and um, you want to have IV methylprednisolone, then you'd, know, you'd want to know what the concentration there is in the breast milk. Now, reassuringly, apparently, um, that the infant exposure after one hour from the infusion is quite low. So if you really wanted to continue breastfeeding, what they ch um, recommended is that you choose to wait two to four hours after having the um, IV methylprednisolone to breastfeed and you will be relatively risk-free. So that's another interesting poster from we've, today. We've had another question in. Um, is Ibudilast a hit and a miss? And unfortunately, I wish I knew. Well, that's like late breaking, isn't yes, it? Yes, and that's tomorrow. So, <laughs> so what you need to do is obviously follow us on Twitter and you will find out um, because the results are going to be told to us. And it should be interesting. It should be interesting. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Well, so I'm here. And we'll post it on the blog, of course, mm -hmm. as well, so that yeah. you can directly as a live feed so yeah. that you can see what's happening as so, far as cyberdolast is concerned. Yeah. Right. Um, so now there is a question about environmental and lifestyle factors, smoking, vitamin D, omega-3. God, okay. Ah. So Don't smoke. <laughs> Don't smoke. Okay. Let, so <laughs> there, there, there was a piece of evidence about how EBB exposure with HLA-DR I'm trying to remember what the risk factor gene is, that there is a, obviously an association between the two. But if you then look at EBV exposure and smoking together, there's appeared to be no added risk of um, uh, 
of uh, um, the environmental risk factors combined. Mm -hmm. um, so that's interesting. Um, vitamin D obviously is I don't think we need any more evidence on how useful vitamin D is as, um, as far as uh, replacement is concerned and it's a definite MS risk factor. Um, omega-3, I uh, don't think we've got sufficient evidence mm -hmm. to talk about omega-3 on that. No, but we did have, I think one of the, the obviously the big um, things that's been happening this week has been uh, cladribine. So mm. it's been, there's been a lot of presentations about cladribine. Um, obviously, this is an, a new drug for those people in Europe, um, and maybe, obviously, you'll see how, how it goes in the States. But um, there were some uh, interesting um, presentations, and what they were showing was kind of that if you take cladribine, that all your immune cells go back to normal. So it's like magic. But we actually have the answer of, of, of why it works, and uh, or why we believe it works. So this actually is, is our own work, so we'll give it a bit of a plug. And what we showed is um, that it's a certain type of B cell that looks like is the main target for cladribine, and when it gets depleted, it gets depleted for quite a long time, and that may be why we have this induction effect. So it probably, I think, perhaps gives us a clue of, of how the immune um, system may drive some of the problems in, in MS, and it gives us new avenues, actually, and it tells us perhaps maybe how some of the other drugs work. So I think, to me, it's one of the highlights. Um, so we have a question um, through which is saying, when can I get cladribine in the UK? Ooh. Do we know? Well, somebody was telling me almost this week. But um, it's, <laughs> no, no, I, I, I heard on the grapevine, certainly um, within November. So yes. that's what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. So there's obviously... Um, Nice have been very nice. I don't know how, but um, that's was some of the rumours I've, I've 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 been led to believe. Oh, and uh, not surprising. Someone wants to know how about ocrelizumab. Well, again, at the moment, <laughs> um, if you're in the US, um, you go down to your local neurologist. And um, but in in Europe, I still think we're still waiting. Um, I'm sure it's a matter of time. Um, it's obviously, again. Anti CD20, which is, mm -hmm. is, is what ocrelizumab does, it's becoming a hot topic, and we've seen quite a few uh, new alternative um, versions of ocrelizumab that are, are in different stages of development. There's uh, a subcutaneous version, and there's mm -hmm. another uh, few different companies making uh, drugs. So we are expecting to see. Um, I mean, know, uh, do you. Do you think we'll be using these as induction treatments rather than actual maintenance therapy? Well, I think so. I mean, and there was some um, work presented by uh, Professor Hauser to show that maybe uh, there, there is some long-term benefit without necessarily dosing as often, but we will have to do the trial to see. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's an, been a quite a lot of work presented with the uh, a, a kind of a, a, a more older version called rituximab, and again, it shows the robustness of the effect. There was some work in relapsing MS, and there was a work in progressive MS as well. Again, suggesting that there is some efficacy of CD20 depletion mm -hmm. in people with progressive MS. So, mm -hmm. um, so another question is why is rituximab not used in the UK, but yes, in Sweden and France? Money. So I think mm -hmm. the NHS won't... Um, reimburse the hospitals, so um, that's the problem for the NHS, it's that uh, the payers won't pay. And so we're good boys and girls, and when uh, anti-CD20 is approved, I'm sure we'll use it. Um, so going back to our burning debates, I mean, there's lots of B-cell treatments in the pipeline. Yeah. Oh, so. God, yeah. And one mm. of the hot ones that was clearly surfacing here, it was called the Bruton uh, tyrosine kinases. Now, what's that? Well, they're basically molecules that are, are, are produced inside cells, and they're particularly mm -hmm. produced inside B cells. And it's a way of um, essentially killing um, B cells. So it's going to be not an antibody. It's going to be a small molecule drug. And there are a number of uh, presentations that were, were shown here. Um, and I even heard on the grapevine that, you know, obviously 
trials are ongoing, so we actually know quite soon whether mm -hmm. these are actually useful uh, in, that, in, in progressive MS. But certainly the, um, the companies are really interested in um, um, uh, B cell treatments. And I think, you know, not mm -hmm. surprising because most of the treatments that work in MS are actually, actually quite good at targeting certain types of B cells. So, makes um, sense. So, someone's asked about stem cell therapies. This is not surprising. I mean, yeah. it's probably the best way of um, rebooting your immune system, which is available yeah. to us. So, why aren't we all doing it? Well, that's the big question. Um, and um, does it work as well as they say it does? Well, I, I, I guess all we can say is there was very, very, very little um, presented here. So, you know, we're talking about what's presented in the ectrums and um, I didn't see really much. There was a, a, a paper looking at a neural stem cells in, implanted into the brain uh, and, mm -hmm. you know, I guess we could say it's probably uh, certainly safe at the moment, yeah. but we, you know, the days are just too early. So um, it's a question of watch this space and um, as time goes by, I'm sure we'll work out how... Um, effective um, stem cell therapy is and how safe it is. There are plans for uh, mm -hmm. trials uh, to kind of address this. Um, unfortunately, I know you were very interested in it, but there wasn't anything presented here, so um, we can't really there talk about it. There was a brief uh, mentioned in the um, induction discussion, mm. but they um, quickly moved from it because of the high mortality risk. Mm. I think that is definitely improving mm. but also if you failed HSCT where mm. do you go to from there so mm. th there was a brief um, sentence about that and I think you may once you do the XYZ therapies and if you're especially doing the escalation approach you then are modifying the immune profile as you go along and you will need to think about how you select your drugs in terms of what the PML risk is but also what you think the immune profile is now like in the person. It may not be the same of what it started off as. We know that uh, different cells repopulate in a different way. And uh, if a B cell treatment didn't work, then uh, would you have to consider a pure T cell therapy? And is there a pure T cell therapy? I mean, I don't think there is. And um, what may have worked in the EAE model, mm. which is a mouse model of MS, may not work in humans. Yeah, I mean, I think, obviously, a mouse is a mouse, and mice don't get um, MS. And so we know that mice, certainly, their disease is T-cell controlled, but the debate is in, in humans whether it's a bit of both. And, you know, if we look, take a step back, and the strong, pure T-cell therapies really haven't um, been active. So, mm -hmm. you know, we, we do probably need something yeah. that targets either both or, or, and also the B cells, and that's been a consistent feature. Um, and we saw some nice work um, where um, the B cells have been used to actually monitor disease activity, and um, this was actually in a, a disease of the um, eye and the optic nerve called okay. like neuromyelitis optica, whereby by monitoring the return of B cells, it informed how um, and when to treat, and it was possible to keep people in long-term remission. So mm -hmm. there is an indication that that may be, you know, those cells could be important in MS. So it may be we could actually personalize treatment uh, as we go down the line, but obviously that's for the future. So someone's asked about ano uh, Anavex. Do you know anything about that? I don't that? know. Do you mean Anavex? Or Avanex? Avanex. It's no. beta interferon. I don't know. Well, so this is something we've missed. We'll come back to yeah. that. And um, we've got Ben Jacobs from our team asking about ibrutinib as a B-cell drug. Um, I think, you know, watch this space. There's going to be tons of mm. B-cell yeah. treatments coming through. And it may be you have to just select your patients appropriately. Yeah, yeah I think, you know, we, we've heard a bit about the Bruton uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. But there's a lot of other um, mm -hmm. molecules to actually target. And I think, um, as we've shown that the B-cell inhibitors are, are active, 
the pharmaceutical companies are making lots of different uh, agents to target different parts of the B cell process. So it's going to be watch this space because I'm sure we're going to get more and more of these. So someone's asked about fatigue and progression treatments and um, well, definitely, if you get rid of the inflammatory activity, you can impact on the fatigue. Mm. Now, um, whether this is more prevalent with the highly active drugs is difficult mm. to say. Yeah, there was a, this, there was a poster all about um, using CD8 T cells to get rid of EBV, and it seemed to be one of the things that uh, seemed to happen is that the people in the trial, it was only involved in 10 patients, um, that their fatigue um, was mm. reduced. And I think... Obviously, to, fatigue in, in part is due to inflammation. So if you can get um, rid of the inflammation, then obviously I think you can uh, get rid of the fatigue to some, uh, some extent. And it, it's important to tackle fatigue, um, as well as uh, mm -hmm. actual other psychiatric complications like depression, because it would impact on um, how you perform in general with your work and day-to-day uh, um, -day activities. Um, they found um, there was an interesting poster saying that um, people who were fatigued, who had cognitive burden, were less likely to be in a functional relationship. So these are very important um, uh, hallmarks of uh, um, how quality of life is in, in, with your MS, really. So I think, you know, I've been told we've got about five minutes left, so it's probably a good idea to start some wrap-up of the sessions. It's packed. It was packed, I would yeah. say. Um, I think, um, you know, do we have treatments for progressive MS? Well, I think um, the signal is there. It's modest, but it's there. We're definitely going to be looking more at the mode of actions of these treatments. So as I said, um, biotin is um, thought to be targeting uh, ATP production and the um, tricyclic acid cycle and also about myelination, which we don't know what the evidence mm -hmm. for that is. But you may also have to think about sodium channel blockade. So mode of action is going to be very important. But I think the take-home message from the progressive trials is that you need to have a good outcome measure, which measures what is felt to be significant in progressive disease. So if you want to do trials on uh, people in wheelchairs, we need to think about protecting yeah. arm function and upper limb function. Yeah, and we had a session from the uh, Progressive MS Alliance, uh, you know, talking about progress that as they've had over mm -hmm. the, the last year, uh, notably in, in new ways of monitoring. And I think that's one of the things that uh, has come out, um, is that the neurofilaments, which we've been working with, mm -hmm. it, it has been shown yeah. that you, know, you can use that as a, potentially as an outcome for monitoring clinical trials. So maybe a way of, of getting information outside just the yeah. uh, MRI. So that's actually nice for us, because it's a nice bit of actually your work, isn't it? Yes. So, um, <laughs> I um, plug my own work. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so another question is, was, what was your famous piece, pay, piece of information this, this week? Ah, oh. um, well, the reintroduction of oligoclonal bands into the McDonald criteria, what can I say? I, don't, I, I think we've been quite vocal on our end about what we think about not having CSF or actual biological markers of MS mm -hmm. in, the, um, in the diagnostic criteria, so that's my take home message mm. and so it, w it was one of the questions that we um, we got from one of the, one of the readers was um, you know about neurofilaments and the variability and I think what was very clear that if you have a drug that is active um, then it drops the neurofilament levels and that is an indication that it's saving mm -hmm. the nerves because mm -hmm. that's a, a nerve pro protein so if you don't have lots of nerve proteins floating around it suggests that there's not a lot of nerve damage, so um, that's good. Goodness, tons of questions are now rolling in. So, um, okay, um, so NF in CSF, how about the blood? Well, um, so this was a question which was posed uh, at my um, talk as well, and uh, I think uh, blood biomarkers are great to have. Yeah. They're good for clinical trials, and when you're looking at vast number of patients, but if you're looking at individual prognosis, the evidence for 
long-term prognosis as far as baseline neurofilament levels are concerned is in the CSF. So um, it's also about validation of these tests over time. So the data for CSF biomarkers is extensive as opposed to blood, which is coming through now. So things may change later on. Now, are we enjoying Ectrims? Is the well, other question. we always enjoy Ectrims. And I think on <laughs> you know, that note, we have to think about what, where we're going. So... Um, <laughs> I think after this. After this, so yeah. I think um, I have enjoyed our time, and mm -hmm. uh, I think our time in Paris is probably coming to an to end. end. Yes. So what happens next? Well, I think you know, uh, next is Berlin, isn't it? Yes. yes. So. So we'll be there in Berlin with hopefully German flag. German flag. And um, we'll be. Hoping, hopefully, we'll actually have a, a lot more new drugs to talk about as well. I think the pipeline for MS is now increasing quite rapidly, so there's definitely mm. going to be new drugs to present. So, um, uh, kind of on that note, I just need to say thank you for joining us, and you know, please visit us on the blog uh, www.ms-res.org, and obviously, tweet tweet us at. At, at bartsms.blog. So thanks for your questions. Mm -hmm. So au revoir, à bientôt à Berlin. And um, that's it, folks. So see you in Berlin. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.